Today I want to share with you 10 essential medicinal herbs to grow for making home remedies. These are all very easy to grow, easy to harvest, and easy to use. Hi sweet friends, I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest, where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient-dense foods like bone broth, ferment, sourdough, and more. So if you enjoy learning about those things, consider subscribing to my channel and don't forget to click on the little notification bell below. That'll let you know every time I upload a new video. Now before we get started, I just want to mention that if you open the description below underneath this video, I'll have timestamps listing each of the herbs that I'm going to discuss. So if there's something specific that you're interested in, you'll know exactly where I'm going to start talking about that and its various medicinal properties. Now when it comes to talking about the medicinal properties of herbs, there are a couple of things that are very important to keep in mind. Number one, if you're pregnant, if you're nursing, if you're thinking of using this for children, if you take medication, either over-the-counter or prescription, or if you have allergies of any kind, you really want to talk to your doctor or your pediatrician or other healthcare pro uh, professional that you use to find out if any of the herbal remedies that you're thinking of using may or may not be appropriate. For example, Herbs, when used in their medicinal capacity, can actually interact with over-the-counter as well as prescription medications and change the effect of those medications. So it's very important that you do talk to your doctor about any herbal remedies you're thinking of incorporating into your daily life. Now those of you who have been with me for a while know that I'm a big fan of integrative medicine. I respect Western medicine and all it can do for us, but I really like the thought of bringing in, you know, home remedies, alternative medicines, complementary medicines, so to speak, that can help bring us some comfort and also some various forms of healing in addition to any Western medicine that we're using. And if you're a fan of integrative medicine like me, you may enjoy books written by Dr. Andrew Weil, who's a Harvard-educated medical doctor uh, who uh, put together the Integrative Medical Center at the University of Arizona, where doctors are trained in these complementary uh, treatments to complement, in essence, Western medicine. And what's nice about the study of integrative medicine is that a lot of research has been done on herbal remedies. And so there's information to show you which herbal remedies actually work, that have been proved in science to actually work, and not just things that are based on old wives' tales. And I wanted to share that because I've had a number of you say to me, oh gee, is it really worth growing these herbs and making these home remedies? Do they really work? Well, the nice thing is, there is so much research on the internet, as well as in some books, which we'll talk about in a minute, that shows you that, yes, there are many home remedies made from herbs that do, in fact, work. Now, the other thing I want to mention is about books. Do not rush out and buy any books about herbs or gardening or anything related to the garden. First, check out at your library what they might have on these subjects and start looking through those books and start educating yourself. Also, you can use the internet. There's lots of information there. But start educating yourself about herbs, about how to grow them, and about what remedies are associated with them. Then, once you have educated yourself on the subject and you've found books that, interest, that are of interest to you, then you can look into purchasing them for your home library, your gardening library, whatever the case may be. But if you are new to all of this, a book that I highly recommend that you look for at your library is, well, first of all, anything by Rosemary Gladstar is going to be excellent. Rosemary has been around, I think, writing books on herbs or doing herbal gardening, I think going back to the 1970s, and she's really an authority on the subject. Uh, but her book, Medicinal Herbs, A Beginner's Guide, is outstanding because it goes over about, you can see it's well loved, <laughs> even, it's even excellent for the non-beginner, uh, but she's got 24 herbs listed in here. And she talks about how to know them, you know, how to recognize them, how to grow them, and how to use them. So I highly recommend this book. Uh, you really can't go wrong, and you can't, can't go wrong with any book that she's written. And I also want to share to all of you who are joining us on this journey from moving from a processed foods kitchen 
to a traditional foods kitchen, beginning to incorporate herbs into your pantry, whether just in the beginning for culinary purposes and then for medicinal purposes, is something that you really want to consider and start learning about. Because the traditional foods kitchen, just like every kitchen, really is the heart of the home. And the traditional foods kitchen is the heart of the traditional home. And learning about herbs and what they can be used for, not only from a culinary standpoint, because often eating certain herbs help digestion and can calm nausea and all sorts of things, but they can also be used for wonderful, for making wonderful preparations, uh, tinctures and salves and all, all sorts of teas, all sorts of things uh, that can bring natural healing uh, processes, so to speak, into your traditional home. Now you may be wondering why I have more than 10 jars here if we're only going to be talking about 10 herbs today. And the reason is that some herbs uh, you're going to want to use both their root as well as their leaves and flowers. So I always like to keep those separate rather than mixed together. So that's why in some cases, uh, in the case of something like echinacea and marshmallow root and marshmallow leaves, I have those separate. We'll talk about those in more detail in a minute. Now, as I said in the beginning, growing herbs is very easy, but you want to find out what hardiness zone you live in. Now, I use the term hardiness zones because that's what we use here in the United States. Uh, but if you live in another country, you'll just want to check with whatever agencies uh, tell you what your growing zone is. Now, I live in Central Texas and I'm in the 8B zone. And so I can pretty much grow anything all year long. Now you can easily look up any of this hardiness zone information on the internet and often your best so source for your area is going to be your extension service. And basically what an extension service is is something that's associated with a large state university in your area. And pretty much all extension services today have websites and they have wonderful information because they will tell you uh, not only what your hardiness zone is, what grows well in your area, and what specific varieties of different plants grow best in your area. So once you know your hardiness zone, you'll know what herbs are going to grow best in your area and what may not be able to be grown in your area. Like if you live in a very cold area, then you'll want to put, for example, something like rosemary in a pot and bring that inside in your very cold winter months because it generally doesn't survive if your temperatures go below around 17 degrees Fahrenheit. And also learning about your hardiness zone will give you some indication if the herbs that you want to grow do best in full sun or partial sun. For example, a lot of herbs that will be described as herbs that grow well in full sun actually in central Texas like a little shade because our full sun in the summer months can be so strong it's almost too strong for a lot of herbs. So I will plant a lot of herbs on the eastern side of my house and they'll get the morning sun but then they're a little protected from the southern and western sun throughout the day and they do very well. Also learning about your hardiness zone and really researching and reading through uh, the extension service website that you have for your area will help you to understand if some of your herbs, although they may die back in the winter, self-seed like calendula, which we're going to talk about next. And so it'll self-seed and then it should come back in the spring. And so that brings us to calendula. Calendula is a lovely herb. It's very pretty. It has a beautiful, as you can see, a yellow orange colored flower, and it's very easy to grow. You can grow pretty much wherever you live. You can sow your seeds right into your garden. Now, speaking of a garden, I don't want you to feel bad if you don't actually have a garden. You can grow so many of these in pots. So even if you're a city dweller and maybe all you have is a little patio or maybe a little balcony or even just a kitchen window or just a window, windowsill in general, there are a lot of these herbs that you can grow. Now, one thing I want to mention is herbs in general often have a lot of healing properties associated with them and they have many healing properties. Many will be found to be anti-inflammatory, antiviral, antimicrobial, antiseptic, 
And many herbs will kind of cross over each other in terms of their various medicinal properties because many of them are in the same family. So even though calendula does have antiseptic and anti-inflammatory properties, what it's best known for is it a, its ability to be made into a salve. And so you would take your flowers and steep them in oil and then use that oil to make a beautiful salve that then you could put on your wounds to help them heal because calendula is associated with cell regeneration. Now don't worry if at this point you're very new to herbs and you're not, uh, you've never tried, you know, making herbal oils and then making tinctures or salves or teas or so on and so forth. I'm going to be following this up in a series of videos and one of which I'll share with you master recipes for making these different types of things. So if this is something that really interests you and you're new to my channel, be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell because that'll notify you when the videos in this series come out. So calendula is wonderful to have in your kitchen garden or any garden for that matter. I think of my herb garden as my kitchen garden because it's right outside my kitchen. But as I said, you can just sow these seeds in the spring uh, right into your garden. You don't have to worry about having any starts inside put them right into your garden. You can also, depending on what hardiness zone you're in, like us here in Central Texas, we can also uh, sow our seeds in the fall as well. And then remember when these start to die back, hopefully they will self-seed in whatever area that you've planted them in. As I mentioned uh, Rosemary Gladstar before in her book, Medicinal Herbs, she talks about how she lives in Vermont. So that's a, a very cold zone and hers do self-seed and come back in the spring. So definitely consider putting calendula into your garden uh, as an herb that you can use to make salves that will be very healing in the event that you get scrapes or cuts or bruises of any kind. It's wonderful to make up and to keep in your kitchen, uh, especially if you get uh, a little cut or scratch or something when you're cooking. Next, I wanna talk about chamomile. And as I mentioned in the very beginning, uh, in terms of being very careful when you use herbs for medicinal purposes, even though we often think of chamomile tea as something that's very calming and very good for sleep, you want to keep in mind that if you have any allergies that are related to things like hay fever, that chamomile and some of these other herbs uh, can, that are all in the same family can cause people who do who are subject to hay fever to be have an allergic reaction so definitely do your research read up on these herbs and then decide what's appropriate for you to grow in your garden you certainly don't want to grow a lot of things that are going to give you hay fever now also in the family of herbs that can cause sensitivity to people who have allergies that are related to things like hay fever, in addition to the chamomile is the calendula that we just talked about. And this, uh, this herb, uh, elecampane, that's the root that I have there, and then echinacea, uh, which is also known as the purple cone flower. This is the one that's uh, associated with really helping to boost immunity. Uh, but you wanna be conscious of these and do your research if you are subject to hay fever because they can uh, cause allergies in people. But if you're okay with growing chamomile, it's very easy to grow, not unlike calendula. You can put the seeds right into the dirt in the spring and you get beautiful flowers, beautiful plants uh, that are just delightful to look at. And chamomile can be brewed into a tea. And you may often think of it as a tea to help you fall asleep. And that is true. It does have properties that make you sleepy. But what is so great about chamomile is that it is actually a very strong anti-inflammatory. And there have been medical studies that have been done. And this is where I was talking about before, when you look at integrative medicine and you look at studies, scientific studies that have been, that have been done on these herbs. And there was a study done on chamomile and they took uh, older people who had arthritis and other inflammatory diseases and instead of them taking their anti-inflammatory medication at bedtime, they had them take chamomile tea. And many of them fell asleep 
pain-free within 10 minutes and had a very restful sleep. So when it comes to chamomile, I think if you're plagued with any aches and pains or you have trouble sleeping, this is definitely a wonderful herb to grow in your garden and make some tea out of. Now I also want to mention about opening the description under the video where you can look at the timestamps where I talk about all of these herbs. Also there you'll find a link to the blog post over on my website, same name here as my YouTube channel, Mary's Nest, where I will have a very extensive blog post talking about all of these herbs in general as well as giving you links to various studies, medical and scientific studies, that show the effectiveness of these herbs for different conditions. Next I want to talk about echinacea, but I also want to mention that if you need seeds to grow these things, or if you're not in a position where you can grow them, or they simply don't grow in your area, I highly recommend checking out a company called Mountain Rose Herbs. Over the years I've bought a lot of seeds from them as well as dried herbs that I couldn't necessarily grow in my kitchen garden. But in the blog post that corresponds with this video, I will have links for each one of these herbs going over to Mountain Rose Herbs where they may have seeds available or the dried herb. And they also have a lot of information on their website about herbs in general, as well as a lot of great recipes for not only using various herbs in culinary dishes, but as well as home remedies. So it's definitely worth checking out. Now when it comes to echinacea, you can grow these from seed. However, you'll want to sow your echinacea seeds in the fall because they prefer a cold period in order to germinate. And there are different varieties of echinacea, but what you're going to be looking for is the one that is called purpurea. And forgive me if I'm not pronouncing it correctly, but it's P-U-R-P-U-R-E-A, purpurea. And it, you'll sow them in the fall, you'll sow your seeds in the fall, and you'll get these beautiful flowers in the spring that here in Texas, and I believe in other parts of the country as well, are called purple cone flowers. Now a lot of people believe that it's only the root that has medicinal purposes of the echinacea plant. But the truth is that both the leaves and the flowers also have medicinal purposes. Now they're not as strong as the root, but they still have medicinal purposes. So you can certainly have them as an ornamental, but you can also use them to make your various home remedies. Now the wonderful thing about echinacea is that it has been studied extensively. And it has been shown to significantly increase the body's resistance to infection by boosting our immune system. That's why you'll often see echinacea as an ingredient in tinctures or syrups or teas to fight colds and flus. Now when it comes to echinacea, you want to harvest the roots when they're about two or three years old. You don't want them to get any older than that because they can become very woody and lose some of their medicinal strength. You also want to harvest the roots in the fall after your plant has grown throughout the spring and the flowers and the leaves are starting to die back and all the nutrients are returning to the roots. So when it comes to echinacea, you want to make sure that you grow enough and that you keep reseeding your, your crop, so to speak, uh, because once you harvest the roots, then basically you've harvested the whole plant and you're not going to have that plant anymore. But a great way to really make use of your echinacea is to start a tincture. You can just put some alcohol in a jar and you can first add some of the leaves and let that sit and then you can add some of the flowers as they bloom and you want the flowers to be in a nice state you don't want them to be getting to where they're wilting but you can just you certainly can have plenty you know for ornamental purposes but you can take some of the flowers and put those into your jar with your alcohol and continue to let those steep and then when the fall comes and you harvest your roots then you can add your roots to your alcohol and uh, allow those to steep along with the leaves and the flowers to really make a lovely tincture. And I'll go into a lot more detail about making these tinctures and salves and so on and so forth, as I had mentioned earlier, over the course of this series of videos on herbs. The next herb I want to talk about is elecampane. And what I have here is the root of elecampane, which is what's commonly used when making uh, home remedies. Now, 
Ella campaign may be something new to you. You may not have heard about it. It is a less common herb, and Rosemary in her book for beginners doesn't, doesn't mention it, but I really wanted to include it in my list of 10 essential herbs, 10 essential medicinal herbs. Now, another book that can come in very handy, as I said, Ella campaign is not listed in Rosemary's book for beginners, but this is a terrific book. Uh, it's called The New Healing Herbs and uh, the essential guide to more than 125 of nature's most potent herbal remedies. Uh, but definitely, this is pretty common, and definitely look for this in your library. And as it says, it's very extensive. I believe Rosemary and her beginner's herb book covers, I think, what was it, 24 herbs? Um, but this covers 125, and pretty much any herb you can think of, you're going to find in that book, and it'll give you a little overview. Uh, but the reason that I wanted to in include Ella Campaign, first of all, yes, you can sow this from seed, but it really does depend, depend what hardiness zone you live in. If you live in a cold climate where you get a fairly good winter, then you'll want to start your seeds indoors and then transplant uh, your, uh, your little plant in the spring into your garden. And then after that, you really don't need seeds anymore. Ella Campaign uh, can grow very well from cuttings. And so you'll want to take cuttings and just root them in a little a nutritious soil uh, with you know a little compost and so on and so forth uh, to get it to root. And then you can have more plants that way. And the reason that I wanted to include uh, Ella campaign in my list of 10 essential medicinal herbs is because more and more research is being done on this herb. Ella campaign has shown promise on potentially treating intestinal parasites. It's also possibly been shown to lower blood pressure as well as be uh, as well as work as a sedative simil similar to chamomile. And something that you may have noticed if you're uh, interested in Greek mythology and, and you've read about Helen of Troy, uh, she was often noted as carrying Ella Campaign with her because when she would travel, you know, this is a mythical character, but when she would travel, uh, she would take the Ella Campaign with her so that if her stomach was upset, uh, by the different foods or whatnot, she would take a tincture or a tea made with Ella Campaign so that to calm her stomach. So that's kind of funny to know. But apparently, this is why scientists are studying Ella Campaign because there are uh, writings, uh, you know, and ancient writings of people using Ella Campaign to battle intestinal parasites. And with them becoming more common around the world, uh, scientists, in addition to Western medication, are often looking, uh, you know, especially in European countries and especially in Germany, where they have a whole commission, I think is it called the E-Commission, uh, that studies uh, herbal remedies uh, for health. And so uh, there's been, they've been doing a lot of research on Ella Campaign. So it's something to keep our eyes open for. And it can also make a very nice ornamental in the garden. It grows, it's pretty significant. It grows to about five feet tall uh, uh, and flowers. And so that's something that uh, you can enjoy in your garden and also start growing it in the event as more research uh, comes to the forefront. Uh, it's something that you might be happy to have in your uh, medicinal uh, herb cabinet. Next, I want to talk about lavender. Now, what I've got here is English lavender, a variety of English lavender, but there are many varieties of lavender, and each variety of lavender brings something slightly different in intensity in terms of medicinal values to the table, so to speak. And if you're familiar with lavender, you know that it has a wonderful fragrance. Oh, that's delightful. And what lavender is known for is its wonderful calming and soothing properties. It can be terrific to make a little uh, sachet and put it into your bath water. And it really helps you relax and it takes all your stress away and it's very calming. Also, something interesting about lavender is that when it's combined with another herb known as feverfew, and I'll discuss that, uh, that herb in another video, but it can be very helpful in relieving migraines. 
So sometimes if you see these different eye, I don't know if you call them sachets, but they go over your whole forehead and your eyes, and they may be a mix of uh, lavender and feverfew, and you put that, maybe you warm that, sometimes they uh, have you warm it in the microwave, or sometimes put it in the refrigerator if you want something cold, and you put that over your eyes and your head. It's supposed to be very helpful uh, in alleviating uh, migraines, and just in general calming uh, a tension headache that might be associated with stress. You can even make a tea with lavender and feverfew. Uh, that's wonderful for, for relieving headaches. And when we talk more in a future video about feverfew, uh, I'll share with you how some people will simply chew the leaves of the herb for relief of a migraine. And the interesting thing about lavender and its calming properties is that from a scientific standpoint, it has been found to uh, contain antispasmodic properties. It calms spasms, and specifically it calms digestive spasms. So often people who uh, are subject to things like irritable bowel syndrome or indigestion, digestive matters, find that herb teas made with lavender can be very soothing and calm the spasms that are associated with digestive disorder. Now, lavender likes to grow in hardiness zones, specifically here in the United States, five through eight, that resemble something a little similar to a Mediterranean climate, because often when you think of lavender, you'll think of the south of France. But there are so many varieties now of lavender, and many have been cultivated to grow in warmer climates as well as cooler climates. But your best success with the lavender is going to be growing it, regardless of the variety that you pick, is going to be growing it from a plant, from an existing plant. Growing lavender from seed can be difficult sometimes and it can be unpredictable. So whenever I grow lavender, and I used to have a lot, but <laughs> after all this cold weather we had here in central Texas, which was very unprecedented, uh, my lavender really doesn't look very good right now. But uh, generally, uh, I've always grown my lavender from small plants that I've purchased. But once you find a place in your garden where your lavender can be very happy, and it does tend to like full sun, you can really get it growing and it'll be very hardy and you'll have the beautiful purple flowers. For the most part, there are some different varieties, but for the most part, the flowers are different uh, shades of purple depending on what variety you pick and all are very fragrant. Uh, so I definitely recommend looking into getting some lavender plants and whether you're putting them in pots if you're a city dweller or you're growing them in your kitchen garden or any garden for that matter, uh, you will be so pleased having a nice row, a nice hedgerow of lavender, not only for the fragrance, but for its wonderful medicinal properties of being very calming and soothing to the digestive tract. And speaking of soothing to the, di the digestive tract, uh, lavender is an ingredient when making the herb mixture Herbs de Provence. And I have a video where I show you how to make Herbs de Provence, and uh, I'll be sure to link to that uh, in the iCards and in the description below. But what's nice when you grow your own lavender, uh, you can make your own Herbs de Provence for a fraction of what a good high quality uh, herb mixture would cost. And you can add in the flowers as well. Now, because if you've seen the Herbe de Provence mixtures that also contain the lavender flowers, they're usually very pricey, but you can literally make it for pennies uh, when you grow your own lavender. Next, I want to talk about lemon balm. This is one of my favorite herbs along with lemon verbena. Well, I actually like anything with lemon. You'll notice I have lemon thyme over here, but I love uh, lemony herbs. And lemon balm is a wonderful herb to be growing in your garden. Now, lemon balm is hardy in zones four through nine, and it's a perennial, meaning that it'll die back in the colder weather, but it'll come back in the spring. Now, if you live in hardiness zones that are cooler than zone four, don't worry. You can still grow lemon balm, but you're gonna grow it as an annual, meaning that it's just going to die, and then that's the end of it. But 
it will probably self-seed. So once you get a little group uh, established, it should be coming back every year for you. Now, one thing I want to mention about lemon balm is that I grow mine here in Central Texas in partial shade. Lemon balm does like sun, but even in your cooler climates, you're going to probably want to grow it in partial sun. Uh, whereas I'm, when I say partial shade, I'm going more shade than sun in central Texas. It's just a little too hot here, or the sun is a little too strong in the summer months uh, for my lemon balm to do well. And even if you're in the cooler climates, you can, it does like sun, but it's happy for a little bit of shade. So partial sun can work very well uh, for growing lemon balm. Lemon balm is wonderful for calming the nervous system and the digestive system. Ancient people used to refer to lemon balm as the elixir of life, which is a lovely way to think about it. And it's because it was a wonderful aid for calming nervousness, calming the jitters, or when you, you hear the expression, oh, my nerves are on edge, or uh, you know, something like that. Having a cup of tea made from lemon balm can be very soothing to your nervous system and help you calm down. Lemon balm is also a wonderful antispasmodic, so it can make a delightful tea to enjoy after dinner because it's very calming to the digestive system and, cause, and causes the calming of any uh, spasms uh, like indigestion that might be caused by the meal that you just ate. And lemon balm mixed with chamomile and even maybe adding in some lavender can make a wonderful evening tea to help calm any digestive upset as well as to cause you to be somewhat sedated and, receive, and, and find yourself getting a nice restful sleep. So it helps uh, calm down indigestion, which a lot of people can be prone to once they lay down in the evening. So the lemon balm will help calm the indigestion and combined with the chamomile and the lavender is overall very calming, very antispasmodic, very relaxing. So that makes a wonderful bedtime tea, lemon balm, lavender, and chamomile. Next, I want to talk about the marshmallow plant. And yes, this is what marshmallows were originally made from. Now, the marshmallow plant prefers a more mild climate. Generally, zones five through eight is where it's going to do best. And you can grow it from seed, but beginners may want to actually start with small plants. And if you're out of that moderate uh, climate zone, and you want to just grow this as an annual, uh, then you would definitely want to start with small plants. But one thing I want to mention, Rosemary Gladstar in her book, Medicinal Herbs for Beginners, talks about how in Vermont, uh, she's in zone three, and she has been successful in growing marshmallow and getting it to come back in the spring because she gets so much snow that she thinks that the snow gives almost in essence to a certain extent a little bit of insulation uh, to the roots of the marshmallow plant so it is coming back in the spring so it's something you'll want to kind of experiment with but generally it's thought of as an herb that grows best in zones five through eight and another thing i want to mention about growing marshmallow is that like the name implies marsh and then mallow, but the marsh implies that it does like your sort of damper, wet soils. And so if you live in a hot climate where the sun can be very strong, it will do best in partial shade where the soil can stay a little more marshy, a little more damp. Now, once you get this herb established, it's going to grow very well. Uh, you want to make sure that you give it a little room in your garden. It does grow, you know, about four feet tall, uh, but it's got pretty leaves. Uh, they're kind of like a grayish green and it's got pink flowers. So it's very pretty to look at, uh, but you want to make sure that you give it a little room. 
Now it's the root that's most common. However, the leaves also can be beneficial in terms of making a tea uh, or a poultice, you know, something that you would put on uh, an inflammation of the skin. But it's really the root that is prized. Now, marshmallow root, along with the leaves, will often be seen in preparations that are made to be very soothing to the respiratory system. And the reason is, specifically, the roots are very high in a compound known as mucilage. And so that is something like the name sounds, like a mucus. And that's why marshmallows were made out of them, because it, is, it does have this sort of mucus-like uh, consistency to it when it's exposed to water. But when you have a very dry, irritated respiratory system and a dry cough, preparations made with marshmallow can be incredibly soothing. And they can also be, these different types of preparations, can be very soothing to the digestive tract, especially when you have a lot of irritation caused by different digestive orders, such as acid reflux. But an important factor to keep in mind that whenever you use a marshmallow root in a medicinal preparation is that you make it with a lot of water or you use a lot of water with it in conjunction with whatever preparation you're using. Because of its high uh, mucilage factor, you want to make sure that that's very well diluted and getting throughout your system. You don't want to create something that would be very, um, that would cause blockage. So really educate yourself when you're working uh, with marshmallow root. And we'll talk more about marshmallow uh, in future videos uh, where we talk about making homemade cough medicines and how to best use the, this herb in those type of preparations. Now I want to talk about peppermint. And I think of probably all of the herbs that are out there, uh, although yes, I am uh, fond of lemon balm and lemon verbena, anything with lemon, I've got to say that peppermint is one of my all-time favorite herbs because even more so than lavender, the fragrance of peppermint, if you like mints, I, not, which I do, I love peppermint. Oh, that's fabulous. Now you can certainly grow peppermint from seed, but if you know of someone who's growing peppermint and anybody who grows mint will have a lot of it, which we'll talk about in a minute, but they can simply just pull out a little bit of a piece of it, a little cutting. Uh, my mother used to do this all the time. She, if she wanted to plant some mint in a place where she wasn't growing it at the time or give some to friends, she'd just pull a little piece out and then like tie the root and give it to them like that and then they would plant it and, and uh, eventually her friends all had very extensive peppermint gardens. And that's a tip about peppermint that I want to share with you. Once it gets established, it can really take over your garden. So you want to think about finding a place where it can grow and expand freely, but you don't have to worry about it taking over all your other plants. I plant my mint just along the side of my house in a little garden area that it can just be on its own for the most part and spread out as much as it wants. Another option for peppermint, or any mint for that matter, uh, is just putting it in pots. That can work very well too, uh, and just keeping them above ground. Sometimes uh, when I was new to gardening, I read something about putting your mint in a pot and then planting the pot in your garden, you know, basically burying the pot, because the pot would keep it contained and not uh, take over your garden. But the thing that I didn't realize was the bottom of a pot, uh, I was using terracotta pots and it had a little hole in the bottom and the roots just went out like that. And I had quite a season uh, getting all that mint out of my garden and under control. Now generally mint likes to grow in hardiness zones between five and nine, uh, but definitely try it no matter where you live because you know it is very aggressive and it is pretty hardy. And so I think that there's a pretty good chance that even if you live in a colder climate, uh, you should be able to grow some mint, at least during the warm months. Now peppermint is probably best known for being an aid for digestion. It's wonderful for calming down nausea as well as gas. And if you've been very ill and you've been vomiting, 
a cup of uh, peppermint tea afterwards once your system has calmed down a little bit and you can hold food down the peppermint tea can be very soothing to your digestive system and the taste of the peppermint can be very pleasant to relieve some of the uh, bitterness associated with in the, in your mouth associated with vomiting also, if you've had a meal that's very heavy in onions and garlic and other very flavorful foods and spices, and you chew on some peppermint leaves, that'll help remove the taste, the aftertaste in your mouth and also down through your digestive system so that when you go to talk with people, you don't have these odors emanating from you. A cup of peppermint tea after a meal like that can also serve the same purpose. Now, something that people may not immediately think of when they think of peppermint, but it can be very helpful in relieving headaches. Just smelling the herb can be extremely helpful. Uh, when my son was a little boy, I used to make uh, little packages of, uh, you know, in a little muslin bag of different herbs, depending on, uh, you know, what particular condition he may be having. And, you know, if he had a little cold or something, I'd put some stimulating herbs for him to smell. And he still has some of those little muslin bags to this day. It's very cute. But putting some peppermint in a muslin bag and maybe keeping it by your bedside, if you tend to wake up with a headache or be prone to headaches uh, in the night when you wake up, smelling some of the peppermint, Oh, it's lovely. It's so invigorating. Can actually help to relieve your headache. It can also uh, be very good at opening up your nasal passages, which sometimes, uh, if they are congested, may be causing your headache because you're getting a lack of oxygen into your brain. And then smelling this peppermint, not unlike eucalyptus, uh, which is very strong as well. And you take that in through your nasal passages, it helps clear out your nasal passages, allows you to take in more oxygen, and then helps relieve your headache. And another interesting thing that peppermint can help with is if you develop a toothache and you're waiting to get in to see the dentist, you can take some peppermint leaves and pack them around the tooth that's bothering you. And the essential oils in peppermint, which are very volatile, meaning they're very strong, very active, will help relieve some of that discomfort. Sort of like a homemade version of like an ambisol. So be sure to give peppermint a try, whether you put it in a pot uh, or you grow it outside in your garden. It's a wonderful herb, uh, not only to enjoy for the fragrance and for making teas, but as you see, it has a lot of wonderful medicinal properties. Next, I want to talk about thyme. Now, yes, this is lemon thyme, but there are all types of varieties of thyme, not unlike a lot of these herbs that have many varieties. There's lemon thyme, which I especially like. Uh, there's English thyme, there's French thyme, which is uh, very good for culinary purposes. There's mother of thyme. There's all sorts of thyme. There's a variegated thyme. Uh, I think there's even a lime thyme. I think I've had that in my garden from time to time. <laughs> And the nice thing about thyme is pretty much whatever hardiness zone you live in, you can grow thyme. Basically, you can sow the seeds in the spring, uh, or if you want, you can start them indoors and then plant the little plants outside. You can also buy thyme plants. They're very common. They're very easy to find and they'll grow very well. Really, the only thing they're going to ask you for is a relatively sunny location. Now thyme is a perennial, which means it'll probably die back in the winter. Uh, here in Central Texas, it's usually growing all year long. Uh, but if you do live in a cooler climate, it'll die back in the winter, but then it should come back in the spring. Now, as I mentioned, there are so many varieties of thyme. There are ones that grow upright. There are ones that grow like carpets. There's just a really big selection. But if you're looking for a thyme that you want to grow primarily for medicinal purposes, there really are two varieties you want to look for. One is the lemon thyme, which is my favorite because it makes a wonderful tea. And the other is just the plain thyme. The, and I believe the Latin is like thymus, if they pronounce it like that, thymus or th thymus, thymus vulgaris. Just your plain common thyme. But whatever type of thyme you do grow, thyme tends to get very woody. 
And so you always want to give it a good trimming. So in the spring, uh, whether it's still growing like and is green, like it is the case here in Central Texas, or it's died back and you're waiting for that new spring growth to come, give it a good trimming. And that way all that new spring growth is going to be much more tender. You're not gonna have the real woody stalks. But what's so great about thyme is that it's one of those really strong herbs that is not only uh, antiseptic, it's also antifungal, antimicrobial, antiviral, and it's also extremely rich in antioxidants, which as scientists tell us, helps fight disease in our bodies. So thyme is a very powerful herb and it's a wonderful disinfectant. It can be used in remedies that involve an external wash, if you have some sort of external infection, it can be made into teas and often used to fight off infections like colds and flus. It's very often used in homemade prepar preparations uh, involving a gargle or a wash uh, for a sore throat. So there are a lot of various home remedies that use thyme in, relating to, uh, in dealing with infections. It's also used in many home remedy preparations to fight uh, fungus infections. So you will see a lot of home remedies uh, dealing with the nail fungus, you know, specifically toe fungus can be very common. And you'll see a lot of home remedies that use thyme uh, to make an antifungal remedy. So we all should definitely be growing thyme since it has such a wide array of healing properties. Definitely something that we wanna have in our medicinal herbal cabinet. Next, I wanna talk about yarrow. Now, yarrow grows very easily. You'll probably see this growing you know, out in the woods or in fields. It grows wherever it's planted. It's very easy to grow and it's very hardy and definitely something you wanna have in your herb garden. Now, yarrow can be started from seed. It'll germinate very easily in your garden and it, it is a perennial. And so that means it'll come back every year and it will also self seed. So you'll find that you'll get wherever you plant your yarrow, you're going to get more yarrow plants. When it comes to hardiness zones, you really don't need to worry about that when it comes to yarrow. Yarrow can pretty much grow anywhere. Now yarrow has very strong antiseptic and anti-inflammatory properties. And it's specifically seen in a lot of remedies where you make a poultice out of it and you apply it to a bruise or an injury or a sprain. Now, one thing I wanna mention about yarrow, in the beginning of this video, I talked about how if you're pregnant or nursing, or you're thinking of using any of these herbs for children, or you have allergies, or you're taking medications, so on and so forth. Something I wanna mention about yarrow, yarrow is generally uh, discouraged for being used anytime you're pregnant. Now this is something you definitely want to talk to your doctor about if you're interested in yarrow, uh, but I think you'll find that when you research yarrow and you read about it in different herb books, it's always going to be discouraged to be used if you are pregnant. So that's just a little something I wanted to share. Yarrow has what's known as styptic properties, and that means that it can stop bleeding. Now, I'm not talking about some major bleeding with a serious wound where you need to go to the hospital, you know, for stitches or whatever the case may be. But often, if you're working in the garden and you grow yarrow and you give yourself a little cut, gardeners will also often grab uh, a bunch of the yarrow leaves and apply them to where they gave themselves a little cut and it will help stop the bleeding. Also, yarrow will often be seen in preparations, homemade preparations, home remedies, uh, that are related to bringing down a fever because yarrow can cause a lot of sweating and the sweating then helps you know, cool the body and bring the fever down. So often when a person has a cold or a flu that may be accompanied with a fever, often yarrow tea is something that an herbalist will prescribe to help get that fever under control. Also, another thing that you'll see yarrow used for is in preparations that are made, like in a salve, 
to put on varicose veins. Women might often have that uh, problem. Sometimes men too, but you often see it a lot in women, especially after pregnancy. They'll have varicose veins in their legs. And there's a salve that's often made with yarrow that helps reduce the appearance of varicose veins. And if that wasn't all, yarrow is also an antispasmodic. So yarrow tea can also help calm digestive disorders. It really has so many purposes, both externally and internally. Well, now that you've got to start on learning about the first set of the 10 essential medicinal herbs to grow in your garden, be sure to click on this video over here where I have an extensive playlist showing you how to use some of these herbs to make wonderful healing home remedies. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country Kitchen. Love and God bless.